Truth here, and it's time for Otaku Evolution. Make sure to like, subscribe, and contribute to my Patreon. Here we are in the second part of my look at 2009's Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, a more accurate adaptation of Hiromu Arakawa's manga. Let's talk about some themes. Massive spoilers, though. One of the themes of Brotherhood is the cycle of revenge and how it rots one's soul. Scar is after the state alchemists for their destruction of his homeland. He is a man obsessed with revenge, completely driven by the urge to lash out at, to be fair, an evil system. He himself is the subject of revenge by Winry, whose parents he killed out of rage in Ishval. But while Winry is devastated and full of anger at Scar, she shows him mercy, which may have begun to change him. Meanwhile, Roy Mustang strives to avenge the death of... Anyway, Roy is partially driven by his need to avenge Hughes' death, which leads him to the ultimate confrontation with Envy, who pulled the trigger. Roy rampages, but is held back before he can deal the final blow by Edward, Scar, and Hawkeye, who've all seen how revenge has destroyed people. Roy is talked down from his rage. Granted, Envy deserved his punishment, but Roy didn't deserve to descend into madness over his revenge. What? I won't stop you from giving in to revenge. Hey! What right do I have to stop someone from taking vengeance? But still. I shudder to think what kind of world a man held captive by his own hate would create once he becomes its ruler. <laughs> redemption is another important theme of the show. Mustang and Hawkeye are both seeking redemption for the atrocities they carried out in the name of the state in Ishval. Roy is looking to become Fuhrer so he can right the wrongs committed against the Ishvalan people. He believes for that to happen, eventually soldiers like him will have to face justice for their crimes. This also holds true for Dr. Marco and Dr. Knox. Knox's family even left because he was a different person after the war. He knows he did wrong, but seeks to one day return to the family life he once enjoyed. Why don't we try to clean up a little before you can tell us not to? I don't know if you actually exist or not, God, but cut me some slack. Even a guy like me needs a break. Just please let me enjoy the happiness of having a cup of coffee with my family. The Elric brothers, too, wish to be absolved of the crime of having done human transmutation. They realize that finding a Philosopher's Stone to return to their bodies is bypassing their punishment, but are at first committed to it until they arrive at the decision not to use people's lives to restore themselves, and instead help the country with their abilities. Likewise, their father Hohenheim feels responsible for the creation of Father from the homunculus in the flask, and leaves his family on a quest to stop him, but he's also looking to redeem himself in the eyes of his sons, too, especially Edward, who hated him for years. You know, Ed, don't you think you should maybe try to be a little nicer to your old man? Yeah, really. You could at least refer to him as Dad. It sounds like you've had a rocky past with him. But he doesn't strike me as the type who'd abandon his wife, you know? The guy must have had his reasons, so why don't you give him a chance to explain? Yeah! Shut up! Did you ever think that I've got my reasons? Oh yeah? Let's hear them then. You're just stubbornly holding a grudge. And as I mentioned, Scar finds redemption himself first by freeing himself of the cycle of revenge, and then by being part of the effort to stop Father's plans, even dueling Fuhrer Bradley himself during the Eclipse. He finally utilizes both deconstruction and reconstruction as his brother intended him, for the sake of helping the country that destroyed his people, 
offering himself, putting himself at risk because of his own need to show that he's more than just a serial killer. At the end of the series, he becomes part of the effort to resettle the remaining Ishvalans, having cleansed himself of his rage. Scott, why don't you tell us your real name? I've died twice now. I'm neither of the people I once was. I don't need a name. Call me anything. Fair enough. The value of human life is also an important theme. When the brothers discover that the Philosopher's Stone is made of live humans, they pledge not to use it to restore their bodies. Edward sees the Slicer brothers, two convicts whose souls were attached to a suit of armor, as just as human as him, because he likewise sees his brother the same way. He sees the souls that make up Envy's monster form as human too, even though they've long lost their bodies. Whether they're chimeras or even homunculi, Edward respects life. Characters like Father and the King of Xerxes play with human lives, having no concern for their value. Hohenheim, on the other hand, learns the name of every disembodied soul within him, and they help undo Father's ambitions. Every single one of these tortured souls has now invaded your being. You're contaminated, and each soul inside you is working with me, working to see your destruction. There are a lot of great scenes in the show. Actually, there are entire episodes I'd like to highlight, but that would take forever. So here's a collection of scenes I like. I mean, besides some of the scenes I've already shown. After Maze Hughes is killed by Envy, naturally there's a funeral, after which Colonel Mustang stands at his friend's grave. Alphonse is kidnapped by Greed's Chimera Posse and brought to the Devil's Nest to meet him. I love this bit because my favorite homunculus is so full of charisma and attitude. See, I'm greed. I want everything you can think of. Money and women. Power and sex. Status. Glory. I demand the finer things. And of course, I crave eternal life. Aren't you already immortal? Well, I guess I was put together a little sturdier than most. I am nearly 200 years old, but I wouldn't exactly say that I'm immortal. So, I've spilled my guts all over, told you my darkest secret. Now it's your turn. One of my favorite scenes from one of my favorite episodes is when Lus corners Alphonse and Hawkeye in the third laboratory. She implies that she's killed Mustang, causing Hawkeye to freak out. Alphonse, remembering the losses of Nina Tucker and Hughes, stands up to the buxom banshee. However, things look hopeless. That is, until... Alphonse <laughs> Well spoken. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Looks like I can get you on your knees after all. He's using the flint for ignition. 
and he carved a transmutation circle into his hand. The Elric brothers finally meet the main antagonist, Father, who looks just like their father, Hohenheim, but isn't him. He takes care of their injuries, but has no interest in helping Ling. After disabling the brothers' alchemy, he decides to turn Ling into a second greed. Ling is surprisingly okay with this. <laughs> お前は真の皇帝になる男だ。他人の二十や三十受け入れるだけのでかい懐がなくてどうする。俺もいけるのいいやつは好きだぜ。だが後悔すんなよ。Am I said, come! I freely accept you! You know, people normally reject me. You're talking to the future Emperor of Xing, monster. I am no normal man. My heart is large enough to hold 20 or 30 of you! <laughs> well, I do like how ambitious you are. Just don't try and change your mind. As I showed before, Mustang and Hawkeye are still shaken by what happened during the Ishval War of Extermination. The state alchemists led the charge to genocide the Ishvalans, with soldiers like Hawkeye supporting them with guns. However, there was one state alchemist who had little problem with what they were doing. Kimbley. お嬢さん、私は嫌々やっている。そういう顔ですね。相手を倒した時、当たった。よしと自分の腕に埋もれ。仕事の達成感を感じる瞬間が全くない you don't allow yourself to feel the slightest tinge of satisfaction and pride in your skills? Well, Miss Marksman... That's enough, Kimberly. I'll tell you what I don't get. Did you people expect something different? You act like you're surprised, like you didn't choose this. Hawkeye is later put under the service of Fuhrer King Bradley, becoming his assistant. One night when she delivers documents to Bradley, who she's already aware is Raph, she discovers the terrible secret of his son, Selim. I'm guessing you're a homunculus, like gluttony. No, you've got some kind of pressure coming from you that he didn't have. I'm offended that you would even put gluttony in me in the same league. You ask my name, it's pride. And I was the first homunculus. After a short battle with Kimberly, Edward is horribly injured, pierced by debris from a collapsing tower. After freeing the trapped chimeras, Edward asks them to help him remove the beam stuck in him. He plans to use alchemy at the moment it's pulled out. One of my other favorite scenes comes during a battle against Envy. The homunculus captures Dr. Marco, revealing that his research team was turned into Philosopher's Stones. Marco doesn't take the news well. You sacrificed many innocent lives to make your damned Philosopher's Stones. I know better than anyone else how much pain goes into creating them. And not only do I know how to create them, but I know how to destroy them as well! On a 
Honestly, I wish this defeat of Envy stuck. I know it was good to have Roy confront the killer of his friend later on, but it was more poetic for Envy to be done in by Marco, who he looked down on the most. It's kind of bullshit that Arakawa found a way to re-inject Envy into the narrative. Speaking of Roy and bullshit, what's with the bit where Roy is forced into a human transmutation and loses his sight? Father had ages to find five sacrifices, and the best he could do was four, and then a nonsensical forced fifth one? Roy didn't even choose this. The things lost from a human transmutation are supposed to be a reflection of one's hubris. If Roy can lose his sight from doing nothing, it defeats the entire plot point. We found your abilities to be quite problematic in the past. You are by far the most troublesome of the state alchemists we've dealt with. I think it's fair to say you've had this coming. Oh, Colonel... You performed it? Human transmutation? Of course not. You think I would willingly do such a thing? And what about those white homunculi zombies in the Fuhrer candidate battle? It just feels like a lot of padding while the author was trying to figure out how to get to the end. And what's with Greed coming to the realization that this whole time he just wanted friends? He already had them in Dublin, and he still wanted immortality back then. What a corny way to go out. Don't get me started on Edward's final transmutation, where he gives up his alchemy gate to restore Alphonse. Like, I get that it was only after Edward went through his journey that he would be in a place to realize he could do this, but it still feels like something he could have easily done to begin with. I understand what Arakawa was going for, saying basically that Edward had become more humble over time, but he was never really arrogant to begin with. His cocky attitude was mostly just a cover for his pain. I think Arakawa wrote herself into a corner. Great. Now that I went off on that tangent, I don't have enough time to go over the rest of my favorite scenes. It'd be all day anyway, since there are so many great moments in this series. So let's compare this series to the first one, because you're all already doing it anyway. It's a bit of a cop-out, but I actually like both FMA shows equally. They're currently tied for third place on my list of favorite anime of all time, at least in terms of TV shows and multi-episode OVAs anyway. They both have things that the other doesn't, but the core of FMA shines through them both, even if the first one didn't follow the manga as closely. Obviously, being the show that did follow the manga more closely, there's more coherent and full world building in Brotherhood. I don't even think the first show even mentioned the name of Amestris, let alone expanded the world to include other countries who impacted the events within Amestris. More characters got complete and fulfilled character arcs in Brotherhood, and let's face it, the homunculi being aspects of Father made more sense than just being failed resurrections with some of the memories of the original person. And I believe Akira Senju's music rivals Machiro Oshima's from 2003. The opening and closing songs are by and large better, but I feel like there was a more personal, emotionally resonant touch to the 2003 show, with its focus on the brothers and what they would do for each other. Some of my favorite characters like Hughes and Sheska are expanded on. The homunculi stories are more personal and engaging. The main villain's motivation and plans, while not as ambitious as Brotherhood's villain's motivation and plans, feel more human, if a little petty. And I'm more of a fan of a bittersweet open-ended conclusion than a more effusively upbeat one. I can probably do a third video on the music and other production values alone, but I'm not going to. I've covered pretty much all I intended to here. I think you should definitely watch Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. It's damn good. If you want to see a series with storytelling and emotional complexities, with standout characters and solid action, a sweeping OST, and thematic and world-building strength, FMA Brotherhood is hard to beat. It's definitely the best anime series to come from a shonen manga. Attack on Titan can suck it. Anyway, that's enough about Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Next time, we'll take a look at another shonen staple. Until then, please like and leave a comment. See ya! Oh. 
how long you want to drag this out, kid. It'd be so much easier if you just stay down! <laughs> There was a hockey game on. I'll catch up on it on YouTube. We're punks anyway. We should care about our own nation's leader most. There's a lot of hockey on. Did the old codger talk about Russia and Ukraine? We should just take out the man in Moscow and be done with it. If you prefer, we could just capture him. What are you afraid of? Bah! If the old codger in NATO doesn't do something soon, I don't care what the council says, I'm gonna solve the problem myself. Alone, if I have to. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah.